All right, so again, good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kenneth Harris. Um, before I get started, the views I am sharing today are my own. I have to give that little disclaimer before any talk, right? Don't want anyone to say I said aliens exist and then go back and tell on me. <laughs> so I've been, I've been um, <clears throat> working on NASA programs for the past 15 years. Again, started in 2008 as an intern. Um, progressed through a number of missions. They are Earth-based missions, uh, human space flight missions, a Mars rover, deep space observation, and ultimately exploration. So I'm not a software engineer, more of a systems engineer that is um, uh, 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 based in mechanical engineering. It's not my first time speaking at the GoTo conference series, so I really feel at home here. So I appreciate you all having me again and to be a, a small break from the rhythm of your day that is generally software topics. Uh, today I have the pleasure of discussing one aspect of how we are, and I have to use, this doesn't work. Oh, it does work. Clicker works. So today I have the pleasure of discussing one aspect of how we are unfolding the universe through the alignment of our state-of-the-art primary mirrors on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, we'll then explore some of the amazing images that Webb has produced for us up to this point. Show of hands really quickly. Has anyone heard of the James Webb Space Telescope? Yes. Has anyone seen images from the James Webb Space Telescope? Yes. Has anyone worked on the James Webb Space Telescope? <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, so let's jump right into it here. So you all know what it is, but I'm going to break it down with some of my favorite images here. The James Webb Space Telescope is the world's largest, most powerful, and most complex space science telescope that we've ever built. Uh, Webb will solve some mysteries of our solar system looking beyond distant worlds. Uh, around the stars, galaxies, galaxy clusters, things of that nature. I'd be remiss if I didn't say it is a collaborative mission between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Canadian Space Agency. So this image on the bottom left there is going to be your fully stowed James Webb Space Telescope. That's how we get into the rocket before it fully deploys. Uh, what's another cool one? Over here to my right, I mean to my left. Ooh, you're right. Um, uh, our technician, Brian, removing the lens cap. Um, or fit checking the lens cap before we actually put it into a stowed configuration to get it on the rocket. Uh, the very popular OTE or the gold mirrors that you see there um, are actually not gold, they're beryllium for anyone that does not know. The amount of gold on James Webb is about, this, is about the amount of gold you can fit inside a golf ball. Um, and lastly, this picture down here, can't see me in it, but this is us putting the James Webb Space Telescope into the famous Chamber A at the Johnson Space uh, Flight Center in Texas, right before the hurricane came through. <laughs> but all is well. All right, um, jumping forward here. So teams working on Webb designed several innovative, and this might be too dark, but it's just a schematic of Webb, um, several innovative and powerful new technologies that make it a very ambitious, um, set of science goals, and I'll walk through this a little more. But here you can just, I, I want to show the scale of Webb. So it's about the size of a tennis court when it's fully uh, deployed, um, but somehow we fit into that rocket, right? It's made up of 139 small kind of mechanical motors that help those uh, solar, um, sorry, sun shield deploy, and a series of actuators that are fitted on the back side of OTE or those gold mirrors that allow us to move um, the mirrors very, very slightly. And I'll talk about that more as we talk about how the mirrors were pointed towards specific light in the galaxy to help us get to the photos that we eventually see. All right. So the lower part of Webb is where you see your five layer sun shield and that's gonna be your, the picture on my left, your right. Um, that's gonna be the sun facing side of the observatory which features things like your antenna, solar power array, your, um, your star tracker, your antennas, things of that nature. And so this is what we call the hot side of the um, observatory or the sun facing side. And I need to get this exact number right because I don't want someone to say I misquote it. Hot side is approximately 400 degrees Kelvin, which is about 260 degrees Fahrenheit and 125 degrees Celsius. And the observing side, and for my audience today, we are all biasly cold side. We love the cold side. Why? Because that's the side that I integrated. So I'm very biasly cold side. So for today, all of you are also very biasly cold side. And so cold side is the observing side of the telescope where you will see your primary mirrors, your secondary mirrors, as well as your instrumentation for how we actually take in that data, process the data, and then spit it back out to the public so you all can see the pretty pictures and things of that nature. Um, see, other fun facts about 
cold side versus hot side. Oh, cold side. Cold side operates at um, juxtaposed to your hot side there. Your cold side operates at 40 degrees Kelvin, which is negative 390 degrees Fahrenheit and negative 235 degrees Celsius. And just to let you know, this distance here from your, uh, from what we call the cold side, just the top of the sunshield to the base or the, the, the top of the hot side is about six meters. So you have six meters to make that, that temperature difference. So on one side, you can basically boil water. On the other side, you can basically freeze nitrogen, all right? So, <laughs> so very, it, it, there's a reason this thing got delayed so much. I won't get into, that's not what we're talking about today. That's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> so, so jumping onto the back, again, this is why we are biasly cold side. Isom, isom is the, um, module or the, comp the compartment where the instrumentation lies. We have four instruments here on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I won't get into details of that today, but uh, NIRCAM and MIRI are the two that I want to um, point out because these are where you get most of your images from, the images that you see. Um, again, this picture is kind of dark here, but uh, ISOM, which is going to be on the very, very back. Let's see, I don't have another picture there. ISOM, which is on the very, very back is going to uh, be your integrated science instrument module. Again, contains those four instruments, and each instrument is almost like a like a Swiss Army knife when it comes to what it can what it can do. And the way that this telescope effectively works is that you have light in the galaxy comes into the telescopes, hits those gold mirrors, bounces back into the secondary mirror, which is on that boom that the uh, that's in front of the telescope then that secondary mirror reflects it into that hole that Brian was uncapping at the beginning of this, into that hole, and then into the instruments that are on the back. The instruments are then funneled through their corresponding cables to the lower part, which is the IEC. Um, and then from the IEC, it's uh, routed down to your antenna on the hot side, which then sends to Earth. <laughs> so that's how you get data from the universe into your instrumentation and then back to Earth. And I also like to remind everyone that if we did not go through this alignment, we did not go through what it takes to make sure that each of these mirror segments are pointing toward the same point of light, what would happen is the light would come into the telescope, it would, it would hit the telescope, and then bounce arbitrarily back out. So it comes to you 13 billion years, it takes that much time for the light to get to you, hits the mirrors, and it bounces back 13 billion years. <laughs> and we don't want that. So we go through this alignment process, and I'll talk about that in a few slides, but that alignment process, just to put it in perspective for you, took about three months to complete because of how meticulous it was. Sorry. All right, so why do we study infrared light? Um, the rainbow of light that the human eye can see in a short, a short portion of the total range of light that we know as the electromagnetic spectrum. Telescopes can be engineered to detect various forms of light based on the instrumentation that's on board. Webb is able to detect near infrared and mid infrared wavelengths, which is the light between the red ends of the visible spectrum. And this is not brand new. So Hubble could do small waves of infrared. Spitzer could do infrared. Um, some ground-based telescopes can do infrared. What's different is that the power, the amount, <laughs> the amount of mirrors that are on board, and the technology that we took Webb to is why and how this is going. This is a different mission entirely. So speaking a little about um, infrared light, in order to capture light that's traveled more than 13 billion years to reach us from when the universe was only hundreds of millions of years old, we need to, a telescope that focused on gathering light that has stretched or redshift over a time frame into that infrared light spectrum. And this is through a phenomenon in the universe we know as cosmological redshift. It's a fun dinner topic. If you ever get into it, just say that. Everyone's impressed. Cosmological redshift. That's actually what it means. So it just means as the light moves from the early universe, it stretches to redder and redder wavelengths. As you see at the beginning of the universe, it's more of the blues, the purples, the whites. Those are more of your ultraviolet light. As it gets, as the universe expands, because the universe does expand, as the universe expands, so does the light. It is stretched to redder and redder wavelengths, which is perfect for what we want James Webb to pick up on here. All right, so this is an example. This is not from Webb. This is an example of a nebula that has been observed for the past probably 50 years. Um, does anyone know what this nebula is called? Probably not. All right, so the, this nebula is called the Cat's Paw Nebula. I don't name it. 
It's Cat's Paw Nebula. Um, there's also things like the Crab Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, the Horsehead Nebula. Again, I don't make these things up. But this is the Cat's Paw Nebula. Uh, so by specializing in infrared light, Webb will be able to see what's beyond the dust. So these are three examples of um, the same spot in the universe. The far leftmost image is going to be uh, from the European Southern Observatory. And so this is an Earth-based observatory that is observing nebula through the Earth's atmosphere. So you have layers of atmosphere, and then you have the layers of dust and clouds in the universe you have to deal with. Um, the middle image is that same, that same observatory, but now we're looking at near-infrared light. And so you can see the difference in them is just the vastness of how many additional celestial bodies you can see in the middle image. And so the Caspar Nebula was captured these three times. I'm sorry, the last one is from uh, Spitzer, which is going to be your mid-infrared light. And Spitzer, uh, the Spitzer was an Earth-orbiting satellite, so you don't have the, the muck and the guck from um, the Earth's atmosphere when you do it. So like Sp Spitzer, where it will be able to see through those dust regions, um, but in a much, much higher resolution. So what does this type of light uh, show us? Invisible light forming stars are inside dense clouds of gas and dust, which then scatters and effectively blocks the visible light from then reaching the telescope. So this is, this is something we found when we launched telescopes uh, near the Earth, which is one of the reasons that uh, Hubble was able to see a lot, but not as much in depth as we hoped it to, and which is why one of the major reasons James Webb is in an L2 orbit, which is 1.5 million kilometers from Earth, um, Lagrange 2 orbit, basically so that it gets away from the light and heat from Earth and the sun and the moon and anything else. So you turn the satellite, you face the sun side, obviously toward the sun, and the cold side, biasly cold side, right? Yeah, okay, but cold side, you face that into the darkness of space so that those instruments can operate at that um, negative 200 and some degree temperature. All uh, right. Okay, so before we look at those really pretty pictures, uh, let's talk about OTE, which again, those beautiful gold mirrors on the front, um, and how it's broken down into these three segments and 18 uh, mirror, mirror segments, which make up your primary mirror. So the team of engineers and scientists from um, Ball, NASA, and the Space Telescope Science Institute use data from our NERI CAM, NERI CAM, which is one of the instruments which is on ISOM, cold side, which is on ISOM, um, to progressively help to align this telescope. The process took place in seven phases that I'll get into in a little bit over the course of three months, uh, which culminated in a fully aligned telescope ready for instrument uh, commissioning. And again, remember, let's keep in mind, these are not the pretty pictures. These are the pictures that we're using just for scientific purposes to show that A, we can see something, the telescope functions, B, each mirror is actually seeing something, and then see how much of that image is each mirror actually bringing back to you. And the goal is for it to work together as a single mirror um, that each of the 18 primary mirror segments needs to be able to work with each other to, in, in, in a fraction of a wavelength. And what we found is that that measurement mathematically comes out to about 50 nanometers or so, which is incredibly small. So think, we use this visualization. So if the entire telescope or the entire OT is the size of the United States, then each individual mirror segment would be the size of Texas. And so as we try to align these giant Texas type puzzle pieces, each mirror would have to be within a margin of error of 1.5 inches from each other. That's the spectrum of how close this thing has to be. It's weird. <laughs> All right. Um, so the first step we need to do is we need to align the telescope relative to the spacecraft. So what you're looking at here is an initial alignment mosaic. This basically says that we cut the telescope on, point where well, we pointed it toward an actual star system, which is star system HD 84406. It doesn't have a name. For whatever reason, it's just HD 84406. Maybe Elon's kid's next name. Um, so, <laughs> so anyway, alignment mosaic. Um, so you cut this thing on, you point it toward the star that you know doesn't have a, a whole lot of other light around it, 
and you say, okay, we know that we have 18 identified sections of light here. Go ahead and count it. It's 18. And so you take those 18, and actually I know because someone's going to say it's 17. This one right here is actually two. One, two. This is two. So count that one as two because someone's going to say it was 17. <laughs> so you take, you take that, and then you see that there are, 18, there are 18 small dots of light up there, so we know that the telescope is pointed and seeing. Um, we know that each mirror segment is capturing light from somewhere. We didn't take that. We take that image and overlay it uh, specifically with that mapping mirror segment that I showed you before. So each one now has an assigned segment that is seeing that piece of light. So you see here, this is going to be your left wing. This is going to be your right wing, and then the corresponding ones outside of that. We see this doesn't really have any shape, right? This is just kind of a scattered plot of of light at this point. So. Uh, but keep in mind that this star was chosen specifically because it's easily identifiable and not crowded by other star and starlights and things of that nature. So it makes it easy to know that at least it's looking at that same blob of light, whatever that, whatever that light might be. Okay. Um, doo -doo -doo. So one by one, each mirror segment uh, determines which segment creates which segmented image. After matching the mirror segments to their respective images, we can then tilt the mirrors to bring all of those images near a common point for further analysis and we call this the image array so before you had the segment and array now you have the image array which is the result of what's happening here oh wait let me go back one other thing so one of the main reasons that we go through this alignment process is because even though we take the time to try to align it here on earth there's a lot of things that can literally rattle the satellite. So when it comes to moving it, when it comes to stowing it, putting on a rocket, the vibrations from rocket launch, being deployed in space, anything can shift that those mirrors from, again, that 1.5 inches, 50 nanometers, whichever you're thinking about, um, can shift it from that, that point of view that we need it to be at. And so this is the reason why we go through this three month long alignment process. And so the second step, and there's a video here, the second step is known as segment alignment. <coughs> After we have the image array from each of these uh, segments, we can perform what's known as segment alignment, which corrects most of the large positioning errors of mirror segments. We do this through a mathematical analysis that we know is phase uh, retrieval to position each of the mirror segments and the secondary mirror itself so that, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. We position each of the secondary, we position each of the segments itself and then fold the secondary mirror or put the boom down so that all the, um, I guess, I don't know how to define it, the, the small margins that could, that could come from other scattered light, it kind of, it goes away once this segment alignment happens. And you start to see that the actual shape of the James Webb's telescope or the OT starts to take form with these light, with these light segments. And so we begin by defocusing the segmented image. So you see it starts off kind of blurred and then goes to being more focused. So that is the defocusing aspect. By, and this is done by moving the secondary mirror slightly to adjust for those alignments that we calculated in the initial image and the segmented alignment sessions. Adjustments of the segment are then result in these 18 well-corrected individual telescopes. So now you have, instead of just having a bunch of random telescopes pointed, well, instead of just having a bunch of random blobs, you now have literally 18 telescopes on one. But that's not the point of where we want it to be one focused, unified primary mirror. So the next step we then get into image stacking. Again, there should be a, yep, there should be a video uh, to put all of the light into a singular place. Each segment image must be stacked on top of one another. The third phase of this process we call image stacking. We tilt the mirror segment so the lights from each mirror falls on top of each other at a common point in the middle of the detector. And for the sake of this, the middle of the detector is going to be, again, that part that Brian was uncapping at the beginning. Um, and, while that and while that concentrates all the light into a single place, the segments themselves are not fully cooperating still with each other. Still those 18 different mirror segments, we still want it to be one. And, so, and through the stacking process, the mirror segments were managed in groups of, um, in three groups. Again, that A, that A group is going to be your internal kind of ring to the telescope, and then uh, the external group B and group C, which alternates as you go around the perimeter of the telescope. And so this process prepares us for the next stage, 
something we call course phasing. And so course phasing outlines what I was saying earlier about the, um, the actuators that are on the backs of, our, of the, um, the primary mirrors, as well as the pistons. You can see this bottom part here is just the up and down motion that we use to tilt our mirrors specifically where we need to go. So although image stacking puts all the light into one place specifically on the detector, the segments are still, again, 18 smaller telescope rather than the big one. The segments need to be lined up from each other in order for us to get that data that we want in the way that we want it. And course phasing conducted three times during the commissioning process, measures, it then measures and corrects the vertical displacement of those mirror segments using the technology that we know as dispersed fringe sensing. And this is used from near cam, uh, the light spectrum on near cam from 20 separate pairings of mirror segments again by the up and down motion of the piston to get us to that that 50 nanometer difference um, what you see here is a what you see there is a um, a pole pattern a pole pattern that basically is showing you the the margin of difference between um, each mirror segments because they're done in groups of two and so we we do each one in groups of two and it basically shows the alignment variation from the pistons that you moved and so this is course phasing the next phase that we get into is what's known as fine phasing. So after all of that, after you get it to a point where it is now looking at the same point, you have those 18 telescopes that form to one, you then uh, take those 18 and you put them in the center of the detector, and then you course correct using the pistons. Now you get to fine phasing. And we do this, what we do is we then turn uh, to a different method of phase retrieval where it's across the entire aperture of the entire telescope at the same time. And for that, we're gonna take the telescope completely out of focus. And instead, we use lenses that are in one of the scientific instruments that are actually on board. And what it does is it automatically um, generates to defocus those images as you're seeing in the, uh, in the slide here. And we took, and, and when we look at these image, images, it takes a whole, uh, it just tells us that we have still a small, tiny alignment errors when it comes to the telescope. And it, the, the image of James Webb here is actually, when it comes back, it's actually highlighting the images that are being moved slightly during the fine phasing in the appropriate defocusing section here. So your lighter color ones are gonna be the ones that are being defocused at that time. And so just like coarse phasing, fine phasing is also conducted three times directly after the coarse phasing. So coarse phasing, fine phasing, coarse phasing, fine phasing, three times. Um, throughout this session, and then they're routinely done throughout Webb's entire lifespan. So these operations measure and correct the remaining alignment using the same defocusing method that we used at the beginning in the segmented alignment. And then, however, instead of using the secondary mirror, we use the optical elements that's found within that scientific instrument, and it varies from negative uh, eight, negative four, plus four, plus eight. And that's just varying depths of defocusing, more or less. All right, and now we are at the, more or less the final step. So there's really not much left here to do, except after your fine phasing, because we've only done it for one instrument at this point, near cam, the telescope will be, um, will need to be aligned to the field of view for the other three instruments that are on board. So now we extend that alignment to all the other instruments, which are in ISOM, and there's four ISOMs, which live on the cold side. There it is, the cold side of the telescope. And so we're lining all of those now. Um, and what we find is that if one is a little off, we'll adjust for that instrument um, individually, as opposed to, again, the full telescope. And this can, I mean, as variations happen, we can still realign to make sure things are being captured in the way we hope them to be captured. All right, so now that that full process is over, after, after we apply the field of view and the corrections that are needed, the key thing left to address is the actual removal of any small residual um, positioning errors that's in the final mirror segments. And so we measure and make corrections using that fine phase processing. We will do a final check of the image quality against each other. And then what you get there is again, pretty dark, but you see that final image on my left, your right, is gonna be, um, James Webb looking at a star or star system and all of the light coming to a one point in the detector and you are rendered this, this pretty, again, it's not a pretty picture, but this pretty picture of 
uh, a star system. And this is actually, this image here, fun fact, is a different image than um, HD84406. Got that memorized. This one's a lot longer. I'll read it to you. I, this one is 2MAS. <laughs> 2MAS J17554042 plus 6551277. That's his name. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so that's the first, that's the first image that was publicly released that showed that we were all looking at one exact um, uh, point in our night sky. This one on the left here is actually a selfie that was rendered from the James Webb Space Telescope. We have what's on board called a pupil lens and actually just allows us to, one, it gives us really cool selfies like this, but two, it allows us to use algorithms to, um, again, see those very, very small errors or small misalignments when it comes to uh, making sure that all the mirror segments are aimed toward the right positioning. All right, so now we get into the fun stuff, the pretty pictures. Um, I'm sure all of you have seen, have you all seen the first deep field view of Webb? Yes? Yes, again. So this one was taken from near, um, from, uh, near Cam. So still to date, and this is one of the, like, the first images that were produced, James Webb has produced the deepest and the sharpest infrared image of a distant universe so far to date, and that still holds true today. Um, we affectionately know it as the Webb's, as Webb's first deep field. Hubble had many deep fields. Um, I didn't want to compare here because we're talking about Webb, not Hubble. But this one is vastly more in-depth, more, um, more revealing of the star systems out there, again, because of redshift, because of how the light has, has stretched. And one of the fun facts about it is that because of the combined mass of this galaxy cluster, um, it actually acts as a gravitational lens that magnifies more distant galaxies. And by gravitational lens, what I mean is around these areas, you see these galaxies are starting to bevel a little bit, is actually gravitational lens just because of the mass of the star systems that are included in, in that galaxy. This deep field, uh, again, was taken by NIRCAM and is a composite image that it just means it's stacked on top of each other. Um, and this image took 12.5 hours to make. To put in perspective, so about half a day to put in perspective, Webb's deep field took a little over two weeks, three weeks, two, three weeks. And this was just put James Webb up there. Okay, we're looking at the right area. We're familiar with this, point it in that direction, give it half a day, and this is what it comes back with. And so this is just a sample of what, what it can really do. So this image again shows the uh, galactic cluster SMAX0723 as it appears about 4.6 billion years ago. Um, with many galaxies both in front and behind it as well. But what you can see is that James Webb, through this near mid infrared, you actually get through a lot more of those uh, dust clouds and plumes and things like that that we were seeing in some of our earlier Hubble images. In addition to taking this image, um, James Webb also utilized instrumentation on board um, uh, from spectro spectroscopy. Um, to reveal physical and chemical properties of planets. So is that my next slide? It's not. But what we'll see, what I'll show you in a further slide is how we took the actual image and compared it to a spectrum of what we were seeing to again see some physical and chemical properties of um, planets out there. And then I'll also discuss some exoplanets as well. And so, okay, hopefully you all can see this. Um, so let, let me put this in perspective for you just a little bit. Um, the first deep field image showed us a galaxy cluster with um, thousands of galaxies that are composed of hundreds and thousands and millions and even billions of planets, celestial bodies, whatever's out there. So um, go with me for a minute. Imagine that it's nighttime. Imagine you're in the countryside. Imagine that you look up and you're sitting under the cosmos that's looming over your head, right? Bunch of stars that you can see even though it's through Earth's atmosphere with your naked eye. And so what you're going to do is you're going to extend your hand out as far as it can go. Put your arm out, extend your hand as far as it can go. Put your index finger out and on the very, very tip of your index finger is a grain of sand. And in that grain of sand is what holds the deep image field from the James Webb Space Telescope. And so what you see is that how small we, you, we all are in the grand scheme of everything that's happening in the universe. Um, and this is one of the main reasons that we explore. This is why we seek to understand, because even 
what we know is a deep field view is really just a small microcosm of the vastness that's out there, right? And so just, again, think, put that in perspective. It blows my mind every time I think about it. <laughs> that's one of the main reasons um, that I am so excited to see these images from web because we just continue to scratch the surface of what's really out there. And speaking of scratch the surface, another instrument, I know you all might have seen this before from my folks that have seen James Webb, um, but utilizing the um, transmission spectrums on James Webb, again, this is an example of how we can see some of the chemical and physical properties of, uh, of some of the exoplanets. So once we're able to use the mirrors as that singular telescope, what we can do is we can point it toward what we know to be existing exoplanets. And we define exoplanets basically meaning that it's a planet, it's a planet that resides in the Goldilocks zone of a star. No need for the lesson on Goldilocks zone, but Goldilocks zone is, it, it, it can have water on the planet. It's not too far or too close to the star for the water to evaporate, or it's not too far for the, earth, so for the water to freeze, liquid water. Um, and so we know that there are many, 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 Goldil there are many, many, many Goldilocks zones and exoplanets that exist. Um, the Kepler missions did a great job of that. And so using the instruments on board James Webb, we've, we've been able to capture the distant signature of water along with the evidence of clouds and haze in atmospheres surrounding hot, puffy gas giant planets orbiting distant star systems. So this is an example from WASP-96b. Um, it's one of more than the 5,000 that were confirmed uh, within the Milky Way. So this is actual exoplanet in the Milky Way. And what you can see here is the and this is measured in photons. So what you see, I guess it's, it's called translational spectroscopy. And basically means that as, uh, so you have, the star, you have the star and you have the orbiting planet. We take measurements of the star and then we take measurements of the planet as it passes in front of the star. And what happens is that when we're taking these measurements, the photons uh, or the light might be absorbed by the atmosphere. We know that exoplanets typically have atmospheres because you need to be able to hold in those molecules. Gra atmosphere, gravity, gravity holds in the molecules that you need. Um, and so because of that, we know that the light, the light we, we know through other missions how light and photons react to atmosphere. So we know what hydrogen, oxygen atoms and molecules look like and water molecules look like when we're looking into these exoplanets. And so that's just an example of how we see waves of light as it corresponds to the corresponding reading for a molecule. And so this is really exciting because it's just the, again, tip of the iceberg when it comes to exploring exoplanets. Um, so this is that same image, the deep field view, and what we've done here is we've actually broken it down into what we'd like to think is the most exciting. <laughs> Out of here is a lot of really exciting ones, but you see some of the older galaxies that are 13.1 billion years, and what you see there is the wavelengths, but the spikes on the wavelengths are what we're seeing to be, again, those molecules that we observe from the spectro or from the translational spectroscopy of one of the instruments. Um, trying to see if there's anything else cool for you here. Oh, again, breaking it down, um, the image on the left is from near cam, image on the right is from near spec, two separate instruments, um, but two different uh, capabilities. We got, got, got about five minutes left, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed through these last few just a bit. Um, so this is an example of the Southern Ring Nebula. So some stars, in my opinion, save the best for last. The dimmer star in the center um, has been sending out rings of gas and dust for thousands and thousands of years. And again, that du those dust, that dust cloud also blocks light. But since James Webb sees an infrared, it can also see the dust cloud as well as the stars that hide behind the dust cloud. Um, so this is an example of a star system that's approximately uh, 2,000, 2, about 2,000, 3,000 light years away, to put it in perspective for you. One light year is six trillion miles. So this thing is 2,500, 3,000 light years away. Um, just to put it in perspective for you. Again, six trillion miles. Um, let's jump to this quickly. Do you see, show of hands, do you see four galaxies here or five? Show of hands for four. Show of hands for five. That's correct. It is five. <laughs> it's five. Um, Stephens Quintet, just a visual group of, of five galaxies, best known for its appearance in It's a Wonderful Life. 
And today, James Webb has, well, not today, but James Webb has revealed or reobserved Stefan's Quintet, which is the galaxy is actually reacting to one another. Their, their gravity is actually pulling and tearing each other apart. So while it looks like very majestic, very beautiful, you think about the concept of these galaxies are ripping each other apart. That's not, that's not good at all. So, <laughs> so think about it like that. Um, so one of the newer images that we've released from James Webb recently within the past month or so is this, is this image of a wolf radiant star, which is called WR-124 Nebula. wolf radiant stars are known to be basically dust clouds. And so what we did was we, we layered an image, one from Miri, one from NearCam. And what you see is you see the dust clouds that are coming from the wolf radiant star here. And then you overlay it or you, you, you have overlaid it with what came from Neri. And now you can see beyond those dust clouds what comes beyond the wolf radiant stars. And again, for, for perspective for you, there's a little range at the bottom to show you two light years um, and just how uh, far across this thing goes. So with and without, one and two, three and, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, so so the, ten, the 10 light years uh, wide nebula is made of material cast off from aging stars and random star systems. And it's just constantly, constantly pushing out dust, which is, and we found that wolf rain stars are responsible for a lot of the dust in the universe. But again, thanks to other missions we've done, we know for a fact that we can use infrared light to see through those dust clouds and hopefully overcome, again, that cosmological red shift and hopefully see into the reasoning behind why wolf radiant stars actually produce what they, in, what they ultimately produce. Um, let me jump to this one. So one of my, this is my second favorite image. My second favorite image from the Hubble is known as the Cosmic Cliffs. Um, this image was taken by Hubble uh, when I was relatively young. Um, and what you see is a really, really thick dust cloud, which you see some images beyond it kind of in this red spectrum. What comes next from the James Webb Space Telescope is, again, one of its first images known as Carina's Nebula. Again, those cosmic cliffs um, where you're seeing it almost in, it's not a three dimension, but you can see just the ultraviolet that comes from these young stars that are starting to uh, uh, sculpt and be formed throughout the galaxy. Um, so you can see literally into the dust clouds here, which makes it a lot more appealing when it comes to, when it comes to uh, uh, exploring the galaxy as a whole. So Webb continues to reveal um, how even these small pockets of the galaxy can be uh, young nurseries for younger star systems. And so lastly, this is my absolute favorite picture from Hubble. It's known as the Pillars of Creation. It came out in 1995. It's one of the first images I, I saw um, of space. There was a, a poster of it hanging in my dad's office. And one of, the, one of the amazing things to think about is just how large this thing is. Um, I, don't, I don't remember the exact number, but I, I, I believe that the pillar itself is about nine light, light years across from top to bottom. Um, and so you think about just how vast that is. And then again, what's hidden inside of it um, when it comes to what Hubble can see and then ultimately what James Webb can see. So James Webb did take a picture of this. Next slide, just tilt your heads like a little to the whatever direction this is for me. And so what you see here is James Webb's rendering of the pillars of creation. So these newly formed star systems are really the, the scene stillers when it comes to this. Um, what you see is the bright orbs that are typically um, diffraction spikes that lie outside of those dusty pillars. Um, these are really, really heavy newly born star systems which are here, which kind of looks like the eye of something, if you were to play it out to be that way. Those are actually younger star systems that are, being, that are beginning to be born. And so um, these stars periodically shoot out supersonic jets that collide with clouds of material like those thick pillars. And this sometimes also results in um, the, the, the clouds kind of shaking a bit. So if you took a picture now, as opposed to um, you know, a, a few years from now, you might see a little different just because the clouds, again, are, are moving from, from a result of those um, star systems being, being born. And so this is my new, takes the crown, is my new favorite image from the James Webb Space Telescope because it has kind of a nostalgic feel to it. Um, I won't get too, too in-depth to that. And lastly, I'd like to throw this into all my presentations. We as engineers 
have a responsibility to constantly give back to the next generation in some way. Um, I encourage you all to visit classrooms. I encourage you to participate in whatever way you can to help encourage our students to continue to pursue this field of engineering. Um, representation matters, you being there matters. You have to um, sometimes meet them where they are and in whatever capacity they need you to be in. Um, so I'd like to throw that at the end of my presentation, even if it seems a bit random, I like to recruit engineers as much as I can any chance I get. Um, I'll stop here because I was told to leave time for questions if you have questions. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here. And don't forget to rate the session in the app. Thank you. <laughs>